Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know by now, uh, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the months of April, May, and June of 2015, and it's on the book of Luke. Uh, Dr. Luke was a Greek physician, and we're going to have some very interesting things to say about Dr. Luke. This is lesson number two in that series for April 11. Before we begin, we hope that you have your Bible handy because we will be looking at some biblical passages, a number of them. But we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we praise God and thank Him for what we're reading here. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the, your, the gift of your Son, what He came to this earth to do, and all that He means to us. Help us to appreciate Him even more as a result of our time of studying together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We mentioned that Luke is a Greek physician, which makes him kind of unique in the Bible, doesn't it? Most of us, and I'm going to read some materials found in the introduction to the Message Bible in the book of Luke, I think this gives us a lot of things to think about. Most of us, most of the time, feel left out kind of misfits. We don't belong. Others seem to be so confident, so sure of themselves. Insiders who know the ropes, old hands and a club from which we are excluded. One of the ways we have responded to this is to form our own club or join one that will have us. Here is at least one place where we are in and the others are out. The clubs range from informal to formal in gatherings that are variously political, social, cultural, and economic. But the one thing they have in common is a principle of exclusion. Identity or worth is achieved by excluding all but the chosen. The terrible price we pay for keeping all those other people out so that we can savor the sweetness of being insiders is a reduction in reality, a shrinkage of life. Nowhere is this price more terrible than when it is paid in the cause of religion. But religion has a long history of doing just that, of reducing the huge mysteries of God to the respectability of club rules, of shrinking the vast human community to a membership. But with God, there are no outsiders. Luke is a most vigorous champion of the outsider, an outsider himself, the only Gentile in an all-Jewish caste, of New Testament writers. He shows how Jesus includes those who typically were treated as outsiders by the religious establishment of the day. Women, common laborers such as sheep herders, the racially different Samaritans, the poor. He will not countenance religion as a club. As Luke tells the story, all of us who have found ourselves on the outside looking in on life with no, with no hope of gaining entrance and who of, us, who of us hasn't felt it, now find the doors wide open, found and welcomed by God in Jesus. And as I mentioned, that's the introduction to Luke and the Gospel of Luke from the Message Bible. So, what do you think about that idea? Luke, a Greek physician, he wasn't there for any of these, these stories. He wasn't there. He never met Jesus. He was a reporter, a reliable reporter, presumably, journalistic reporter. Should we trust someone like that? Well, he, he, he does some very interesting things that none of, the, none of the other Bible writers do to try to give us, prove to us that he knows what he's talking about and that his story is reliable. In contrast to the mighty men of power and influence that we use to date the birth of Jesus, you remember there was Caesar and there was Herod and there were those other people, John the Baptist was a humble man of the wilderness, another outsider, if you will. He was sent for one purpose. He was sent to prepare the way for the most important event so far in human history, the coming of Jesus. An outsider talking about the coming of the most important person who's ever lived on this earth. What does that tell us? We all like to be insiders, don't we? Pretty much in our society. Pretty much? 
Well, what do we know about John? John the Baptist in this case. You know, he was... He, the place where he ministered was just recently rediscovered, and I was there about a year and a half ago, on the east side of the Jordan River, down not too far from Jericho, sort of across the Jordan River from the Jericho, and they found ruins there and so forth that almost certainly is the place where John the Baptist was baptizing. Not too far from there, on the, back on the Jericho side and a little farther to the south, is the Qumran community. And it's interesting that some of the things that John seems to talk about are similar to some of the things that the Qumran people talked about. Do you think he ever had any contact with those Qumran people, the people who made the famous documents there that are buried in the cave back there? It seemed possible. They all lived a very simple mm -hmm. monastic kind of a life. Mm -hmm. No frills mm -hmm. the way they lived. No, 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 no. Well, Let's just look at these verses. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. I'm not going to read the whole way, all, all of it. It was the 15th year of the rule of the emperor Tiberius. Pontius Pilate was governor in Judea. Herod was ruler in Galilee. And his brother Philip was ruler of the territory of Ituria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler of Abilene, and Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Now, why did we need to know all of that? For no other reason, identification is well recorded in Roman history. Okay, so Luke is trying... Yeah, what? It's an authentication. Yeah, Luke is trying to say, look, I'm going to show you exactly when this happened, who was doing what. This is a real story. This is not a fairy tale. This is not just some kind of metaphor or something like that. This is a real story. At that time, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. So John went throughout the whole territory of the River of Jordan preaching, Turn away from your sins and be baptized, and God will forgive your sins. As it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, someone is shouting in the desert, Get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him to travel. Every valley must be filled up, every hill and mountain leveled off. The winding roads must be made straight, and the rough paths made smooth. The whole human race will see God's salvation. And I'm going to stop there. Um, what, well, how do you think that kind of a message would be received? Well, John the Baptist was a Levite. How do we know that? Mm. I'm not trying to stump everybody here. His father. Yeah, I was going to say. His father was yeah, of the priest. tribe of Levi and ministering in the temple in Jerusalem when he got the word that his John was going to be a born. Well, it wasn't he? Do you think? Uh, as a descendant of the tribe of Levar, perhaps even from the family of Aaron, that he ever thought about ministering in the temple in Jerusalem? I would suspect, especially since his father obviously yeah. was, uh, was ministering in the temple. Mm -hmm. We don't really know that, do we? He, he may have tangled with them before and decided he was better on his own, for all we yeah. know. Well, he certainly had a bigger impact on Judaism and the world, for that matter, than any of the people administering the temple at that point in time. Well, jo John didn't beat around the bush, did he? So the, the fact that uh, here in chapter 3, verse 4 says she, that he was in the desert, that is the area where the Qumran community is, or, yeah. or was. But, so, but we don't know for sure whether it's desert on the west side of the Jordan or the desert on the east side of Jordan, as far as that, that particular passage is concerned. But they were on the west. He was most of the time on the east, as far as we know. But that certainly doesn't mean they, they didn't get together at some point. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly didn't sugarcoat his words, did he? His message, repent and be baptized. Turn from your sins, share with the poor, do not cheat taxpayers, and do not just claim Abraham as your ancestor, thinking that will save you. Wow. Why do you suppose he talked like that? What? He wasn't beating around the bush, was he? No. And yet he, he shook up the nation. He shook up the entire nation. Hordes of people were going out there to, to hear him. 
I, to me, it, 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 you know, when you come down to Christ's birth, the shepherds were looking for it. No reason why John wasn't looking for it either in his time. Yeah. Well, all four of the jo Gospels mention, at least briefly, the mission and message of John the Baptist. You, if you would like up to look up our, our uh, materials, they're available on our website, but uh, you can see them on the screen behind me. Uh, Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, and 7, and also John 1, um, the message and mission of John are mentioned. How do you think you might have responded personally? You out there in the audience? How do you think you would have responded if someone came to your church preaching a message like John the Baptist's message? Well, Go ahead. where would he get off in saying that it doesn't matter if you're a descendant of Abraham? Well, that was certainly shook them up. I know, but where, where would he have gotten that from? Well, how would they know that he was saying anything substantial here without just calling him a crackpot? Well, the truth is that you can substantiate that quite well from the Old Testament if you start looking around. So, so you think he was, he was uh, repeating the Old Testament as he I was I think talking? he probably quoted the Old Testament, yeah. And they just didn't... Uh... Well, I mean, they knew, that, they knew those verses were there, but they, that wasn't the verses they wanted to focus on. They wanted to focus on the verses that say, the Messiah has come, he's going to rescue us from slavery, he's going to do for us what Moses did for the children of Israel when they were in the land of Egypt. That's what we want to talk about. The fact that Christ saw what was going on in the temple probably from the age of 12 or earlier they were roughly the same age. John had probably seen the same thing and or yeah. heard comments from his father. There's uh, all kinds of reasons why he decided to change the tune. Yeah. Well, the message of John had some profound implications, and let's just look at some of them. One, he said clearly, being Abraham's child does not guarantee that one would be the natural recipient of salvation. Redemption from sin or a claim to heaven is not tied to heritage or legacy, but a per to a personal choice to walk in the way of the Lord. How do you think that uh, floated in, in, among the Israelites? Well, I sure would like to have heard his, his Bible reasoning for it yeah. from the Scripture. I mean, he's just reporting his conclusion, but he must have went through it somehow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Definitely. I'd, I'd like to hear oh. that. You know, in the schools in those days, those who had the privilege of going to school about the only textbook they had was the Bible. And they knew those, those Bibles very well. There's some who say that one of the main tasks for primary school students was to memorize, memorize huge sections of the Old Testament. So, I mean, they knew those passages. Just, he, was, he was quoting them and, and using them in a very different way than what they were used to. Well, still, the, the Pharisees, which are supposed yeah. to know the Bible too, said that, that our father is Abraham. Yep. You know, and started talking as if, you know, that connection was all there was and they yep. had it. Yep. So even though they, they knew all that stuff in the Bible, they were still coming yep. coming out saying that. Not arguing with you at all. That message that being a child of Abraham doesn't guarantee you salvation is probably the one that would make the least friends in, in, the, in Judah, in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he went on to say, walking in that way will lead to bearing good, walking in God's way will lead to bearing good fruit for God's kingdom. And three, it will pre prepare one to walk in, preparing to walk in God's way demands that we repent and be baptized. Now, did they know anything about baptism before John? Absolutely. Yeah. Where did, why did, why did they know about John, about baptism? My understanding is that they would baptize Gentiles into the Jewish faith. If, if you were a Gentile and you wanted to become a Jew and you wanted to be circumcised and become a real proper Jew, you, you, you were baptized. And that was in, by immersion? By immersion. Now, and, if well, because that's what the Greek word baptize means. Yes. Now, if, if, if they were baptizing Gentiles to bring them into the Jewish faith, 
What was the symbolic meaning of baptism when they did that? Well, I don't have any references of what they said about it, which is sort of what you're asking. Uh, I know what we think it means. I, I'm not sure what they thought it meant. That's kind of it's kind of puzzling, actually. Yeah. I think. Hmm. So I, well, it should probably be mentioned that I think the Jews did not proselytize or try to convert the Gentiles. But if a Gentile wanted to become a Jew, this was the well. Mechanism, but Jesus it? said, you know, he said, you cross oceans and continents and so forth to try to make one convert, and when you've made one convert, he's twice the son of hell as he was before you got a hold of him. So they made some efforts. That, that's Matthew 23, in case you want to look it up. Well, he suggested not only that you need to be baptized by water, but he said someone is coming after me that's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and fire. What does that mean? I don't know what the Holy Spirit means, but the fire could be many things. They had tongues of fire on the disciples' head before Christ returned to heaven. Sounds to me in some ways like John may have had a vision or two somewhere. We don't yeah. know. Well, then are we baptized with fire today? Well, we know that John had a vision because how did he know? Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, he was told, uh, Ellen White would, would speaks to us, said that he was told the way he was going to identify Jesus is he would see this dove descending yeah. upon him. Because otherwise, how would he know? I mean, there's all these people, hundreds and hundreds of people coming out to hearing him preach. How does he know when Jesus shows up? Well, the Jews were familiar with baptism. We've already mentioned that. Um, the Greek word for repent is metanoia. What does metanoia mean? Do you know? Turn Turning around, changing your mind. Changing your mind. What does it mean to change your mind about God. Learn the truth and change mm -hmm. your thinking. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that, that you fully repent when you can explain what you used to believe and now this is what you believe now. Mm -hmm. That when you go through repentance, you, you actually can put those two things together. It's more than just saying, well, you know, I, I took too many cookies yesterday and so I'm repenting from that, that, that isn't like what repenting really is. It's, no. it's a complete turnaround from where you were before. Yeah. Well, Paul, of course, in Romans 6, the first six verses, says baptism is supposed to be an outward symbol of the, the fact that you have died to your old man of sin, you've died to your old way of life, and you have accepted a new way of life, and you're determined to live according to that new guidance, that Holy Spirit's guidance in this new life. So it's you're buried under the water, the old person, and you rise to new life. That's what Paul says. So is that speaking of resurrection? Yeah. So yeah. is that what they were thinking when they were baptized with John? Was that what I'm they were sure. thinking when they were baptizing Gentiles, Gentiles? to, to um, Jews? Hmm. I, I don't know. That's a good question. And I don't, I've never heard anyone talk about that, so I, I don't know if there's any evidence about that. It had to be something similar for a Gentile yeah. to turn right around and uh, adopt the way of worship and diet and what have you. Okay, so now, <coughs> in this particular case, Jesus came to John. What happened? Now, if we follow the, we're going to read some words from Ellen Wright in a moment that say he identified Jesus because he saw a dove descending upon him. Okay, what, what, what was the sequence of that? What happened? He was baptized in the Jordan River. He came up. Luke says he stopped and he stopped and he knelt on the bank and prayed. She says that the angels had never heard such a prayer. Never, ever heard such a prayer. And what else happened at that point in time? The voice. Yeah, the voice yeah. There was voice a voice saying what? This is my son. This is my beloved son, yeah. So that was the father speaking. What else will happen at that point? We just mentioned a moment ago. The dove came down, 
Some people saw the dove. Some people heard the voice. Most of the people did not. And what did the dove represent? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So what do we have here? We have Father, Holy Spirit, and Son all present to inaugurate the ministry of Jesus Christ. By the way, is that event ever predicted in the Old Testament? I'm not trying to ask too many tough questions here. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's predicted in Daniel 7. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Daniel 7. Where he said, what, what is it? I'm sorry. No, I'm not Daniel 7, Daniel 9. 24 to 27 is what I was thinking of. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. all three would be present. Well, he said that there would be signs. This would be the beginning of the ministry. And this is the, this is the beginning of the final week of that 70-week prophecy. It's exactly when it happened. And it can be documented that all the predictions fit exactly. Was it appropriate for Jesus to be baptized? Yes. Well, that was one of the next questions we wanted to ask. Why do people normally get baptized? Well, Christ made it known that he wanted to be baptized. Yes. John said, I'm not worthy to do it. Yes. And Christ replied, it's part of me being here. I need to be baptized, put it simply. Yeah, and he, he did that because he wanted to be an example to yes. us. You know, not only that, but it's almost a prophecy. He acted <coughs> out a prophecy that was going to happen to him. Because he was going to be buried and brought up again. Yep. So there's, there's that angle you could look at too. So part of John's message was repent and be baptized. But mm -hmm. Jesus had nothing to repent of. Yeah. So as you say, he was baptized as an example. Yeah. Well, look at these words from Ellen White. Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins and closely related by the circumstances of their birth. Yet they had had no direct acquaintance with each other. The life of Jesus had been spent at Nazareth in Galilee, that of John in the wilderness of Judea. Amid widely different surroundings, they had lived in seclusion and had had no communication with each other. Providence, that would be God, had ordered this. No occasion was to be given for the charge that they had conspired together to support each other's claims. Desire Pages, page 109, paragraph 2. I thought that was very significant, very significant. Well, only Luke mentioned that Jesus bowed in prayer on the bank of the Jordan as he came up from his baptism. The angels had never heard such a prayer, and you can read all about this, uh, Desire of Ages, page 111, paragraph 6 through 112, paragraph 5. The, they wanted to respond to that, repair, that prayer themselves, but the Father himself responded, and of course that was his time when he, he was heard speaking. Only a few of the people present discerned the vision of the dove or the voice from heaven. Now I wonder, think about that situation. Here's crowds gathering around, here all listening to John, people are being baptized. She says that Jesus was the last one to be baptized at that point in time. He comes up out of the water, he kneels and begins to pray, and then a dove comes down and a voice is heard, and only a few of the people are aware of the voice and aware of the dove. Do you think, do you think they said anything to the other people who, huh, what are you talking about? So what would be the point or the significance to that? I mean, all these people were going out to hear. Yeah. So were they not sincere or something? Or did God just do that to make some sort of point that maybe we ought to think about? I, 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 I'm quite certain that he just revealed the voice and the dove to the people that he thought, thought well, he knew would be a future part of his, of his ministry. Could be. <laughs> okay, well, go and look at Desire of Ages and see what you conclude. Yeah. We see proof that all the members of the Trinity were giving their seal of approval to the ministry of Jesus. Look at Luke 4, the first two verses. They're very interesting. Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit. Now he's just received the dove descending upon him and was led by the Spirit into the de desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Is that what actually happened? What, what, what is it? What, does that mean that he was tempted for all 40 of those days? 
That isn't what other sources suggest, including no. Ellen White. And all that time he ate nothing, so that he was hungry when it was over. Hungry when it over. Let's see if we can figure out what that means. Again, I, I'm going to turn to Ellen White. At the Savior's baptism, Satan was among the witnesses. He saw the Father's glory overshadowing his Son. He heard the voice of Jehovah testifying to the divinity of Jesus. So who was it that heard the voice and saw the dove? Among others, Satan did. Satan, was there. Satan himself and his angels, they saw what was happening there. Now that's really kind of ironic because you've got these people that did hear, you've got these people that didn't hear, and you might point to the people that didn't hear like there, were, there was something wrong, but Satan and his angels heard it too. So Because they could go figure. They can see God, they can see angels, they know when something like... I mean, this is exactly what happens at the end of Jesus' life. There's this incredible battle going on in the Garden of Gethsemane and, in, and on Calvary between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and they saw all that. We, we didn't see any of it. We did not see one. Our representatives who were supposed to be there fully cognizant of what was going on, they were sleeping. So I read on. He heard, well, ever since Adam's sin, the human race had been cut off from the direct communion with God. The intercourse between heaven and earth had been through Christ. But now that Jesus had come in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Father himself spoke. He had before communicated with humanity through Christ. Now he communicated with humanity in Christ. Satan had hoped that God's abhorrence of evil would bring an eternal separation between heaven and earth, but now it was manifest that the connection between God and man had been restored. Why do you suppose Satan was hoping that this earth would be forever cut off from God's presence, from God's will and communication? Well, doesn't that mean that when you're cut off that you're dead? Well, if you're cut off completely from the source of life, you would be dead, yes. There's well, going to be the heavy zone world without any opposition. Satan wanted this world as his kingdom. He yeah. said, God, you can have the rest of the universe. Just give me this world. This will be my place. How, how could that possibly even happen if they're cut off from, G, from God? Because we're, we've been saying that when you're cut off from God that you die. Yes, exactly. So how do you, his kingdom must have been a kingdom of death. Yeah, it is. We're not saying that this really would have happened, that Satan would have had this earth to himself if God had cut it off. That's what Satan hoped for, to be cut off from God's jurisdiction, but, jurisdiction, but still have his, his life-giving power, his so vent he artificial ventilation. Himself, what would happen if he was no, completely He didn't understand all the implications of no. what he was wanting, what he was asking. Yeah. Right. Craziness, completely crazy. Try to apply reason to to a nutcase. Yeah. I mean, you can if you talk to somebody that's goofy. You know, you can work things out and explain it to them, and perfectly logical. You had a great experience. The person is still wacko. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's uh, you gotta be careful. <laughs> who's wacko is talk, calling who's wacko. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mention any names. Name. <laughs> There's no names involved. It's just the way it is. You think you can. String some syllables together in a nice, organized manner, and the person is still mm. stuck where they're at in their paradigm. Well, and I read on, while in the wilderness, Christ fasted, but he was insensible to hunger. Engaged in constant prayer to his father for a preparation to resist the adversary, what's he praying for? To resist the adversary. Preparation to resist the adversary. Think about that. Christ so, so he knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. Christ did not feel the pangs of hunger. He was in such close communication with God, Father and Holy Spirit. That's all he was thinking about. He didn't, even the, his hunger pains, didn't, didn't, he couldn't even notice them. He couldn't even think of them. He spent the time in earnest prayer shut in with God. It was as if he were in the presence of his father, which technically he was. The thought of the warfare between him, uh, before him made him oblivious to all else, and his soul was fed with the bread of life 
just as today those tempted souls will, will be led, fed who go to God for aid. I'm going to stop there for a second. I want you to think carefully. Can you think of another time when Jesus said, I'm so excited about the gospel opportunities here that I don't even, don't even think about food? The woman at the well. The woman at the well of Samaria. Exactly. They yeah. brought all that food to him and he said, man, I've got food you don't even know anything about. Same story exactly. Mm -hmm. He did not realize any sense of hunger until the 40 days of his fast were ended. The vision passed away and then, with strong craving of Christ's human nature, called for food. Now was Satan's opportunity for make his assault. So, what can we say about that? The 40 days were spent doing what? Preparing. Communing with God, the Father and the Holy Spirit, preparing to meet his adversary. And at the end of the 40 days, what happens? He meets his adversary, right? He resolved to appear as one of, this is Satan now, resolved to appear as one of the angels of light that had appeared to Christ in his vision. So apparently there were angels also appearing to Christ during this time, coming down, etc., in this time of communion. And now he appears just as if he's another one of those angels. Satan appears as if he's just another one of those angels. The life of Christ was a perpetual warfare against satanic agencies. A I mean, imagine, think about the lives we live. Do we even imagine what it would be like to be in perpetual warfare with Satan? think in some ways we are, and we don't always realize Exactly. <clears throat> Satan rallied the whole energies of apostasy against the Son of God. The conflict increased in fierceness and malignity as again and again the prey was taken out of his hands. Satan assailed Christ through every conceivable form of temptation. And like I said, you can, you can get most of these quotes from uh, Volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, the, the extra quotes from Ellen White, page 1080, uh, in the various things there, but some of them come from other places. I pulled together a lot of material here. Satan saw that he must either conquer or be conquered. The issues of the conflict involved too much to be entrusted to his confederate angels. He must personally conduct the warfare. That's the Desire of Ages, page 116, paragraph 2 to 3. It's interesting that someone did a study on war and said, and I, I obviously don't have all that study and I don't know exactly what his basis was for saying this, but he said, in all the recorded history of mankind, there have only been 11 years when there was no warfare, that recorded warfare. Three of those years were during the ministry of Jesus. Guess what Satan was doing? <laughs> He had his own private warfare going on. These were real temptations, no pretense. Christ suffered being tempted, Hebrews 2.18. Angels of heaven were on the scene on that occasion and kept the standard uplifted that Satan should not exceed his bounds and overpower the human nature of Christ. What does that mean? Well, it looks like the, the test was on God, wasn't it? Tell me what you mean by that. Does, does the character of God stick with God? Mm -hmm. does, it, does it stay with Him? Does it, is it all-powerful mm -hmm. as if it's supposed to be? Okay, now I'm going to ask you all to do something that I don't want you to do very often, to think like Satan. What would you have tried to do if you were Satan right at that point in time? Eliminate Jesus. Well, the first choice, his absolute number one choice, would be to get Jesus to sin. And he would have, I mean, he would have celebrated throughout the universe. That was his number one choice. He would have said, I proved my case, I won the great controversy. What would it look like if he did sin? If Jesus sinned? Yeah the entire universe would come up. Well, I mean, what, what would have happened different that you would say, okay, Jesus well, sinned? Well, if he, if he responded to any one of the three temptations, just for example, if he'd said, okay, let me prove to you that I'm God, I'll turn that stone into bread. So that would be a sin. That would be a sin. 
because he would be admitting to the fact that he, would, he, he had doubts about his mission. He had doubts about his relationship to God. He has to do something to prove it. I mean, those, I hope you recognize what we're saying. We're saying these are not just fun arguments. These are real temptations that he went through. They look like they're divine temptations. Yeah, they are. That's, that's even beyond what Adam and Eve had to go through. Absolutely. Way beyond what Adam and Eve had to go through. At the end of the 40 days, he was next to death. Yeah. Well, and, His, and, and I'm going to read you in a moment or two a, par a thing from Ellen White that says basically the ministers, the angels had to come and minister to him after the temptations, and he was, a, he was at the point of death. Yeah. So Satan's number one choice would have been to get Jesus to sin. He would have claimed victory in the great controversy. His second choice, if he couldn't get Jesus to sin, would be to either, well, I should say second and third would sort of go together. They accomplish the same thing. Either to get to, to destroy Jesus, like he tried to destroy him back when he was an infant, so he couldn't do his ministry. He would have loved to kill Jesus right on the spot. Or to make things so difficult for him that Jesus would give up and go back to heaven. Even if he didn't sin, just said, forget it, this is too difficult, I'll just go back to heaven. And Satan only has one other trick that he tried, he tried, to, tried at the very end of Jesus' life. What was that one? Do you remember? He said, I couldn't get him to sin. I couldn't get him to give up. I'll try my level best to keep him in that grave. He couldn't do that either. He lost on all three accounts. Couldn't destroy him. So Satan was a losing, lost in all three of those battles. I have to go back to the 40 days. Yeah. Because I'm thinking 40 days and he is preparing to meet his adversary. What does it say about what we have to do? I was afraid you'd ask that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he, he had already had his life up to that point in a very close relationship with God. Yes. Don't you think, though, that the, his relationship was the very armor that, that won him, that he won oh, with? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, that's, so that, in a way, is telling us where the strength came from. Yeah. He was, for 40 days, didn't eat, didn't do anything. He was proving that he was connected to God. Mm -hmm. And since he was connected to God, that that is what, he went right into the temptations connected that way. I don't think there was any way that, that he would have um, failed. Yeah. Is that an, is, is, he's connected with well, God. But let's, let's, Ellen White says, the Bible doesn't really say this, very explicitly, but she says these would were not would not have been temptations at all unless there was a real possibility for Jesus to fail. There was a real possibility for Jesus to fail. What Gary was referring to is is that what Jesus had available to him is it not available to the rest of us? It's available to the rest of us. So it, it is, but I'm just thinking, you know, so we don't a, have what Christ had in his relationship. I mean, I'm not saying that he wasn't human, but yeah. yes, we have the same thing, but I feel like there's, there's still that gap. You, you think there might be a gap somewhere, huh? Yeah. So <laughs> what, what could I'm feeling we, like I'm in that gap. What could we do to come close, as close as we can, to how Jesus prepared for this. Well, Would it be Bible study and prayer and course. fasting? Yes. And but, but not to the point of 40 days of no. fasting. No, no, that's true. Yeah. So, but let's make it very clear. The temptations, the 40 days in the wilderness, almost that entire time was spent Jesus in close association with his Father. Some people take this verse from Luke and say, Look, God led him up there so he could be tempted by the devil. No, God led him up there so he could spend 40 days with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And at the end of that, when all of a sudden the Father sort of says, okay, it's time to end our, our time, our 40 days, suddenly Jesus is faint, basically, with hunger. 
the Holy, I mean, this Satan jumps in, thinks that he can take advantage of things right at the end of the 40 days. So was this 40 days to prepare him for his whole ministry yes. or to face the devil or both? Well, to face the devil during his entire ministry. Yeah. You know, you can look at this, though, as, as the temptation is not really turning the, the, the stone and the bread. The temptation first is for God to separate himself from, from his son. And as soon as that happens, well, then the temptation is possible. Well, think, it from, think of it just from a human perspective. Someone comes to you, you're desperately hungry. And someone says, I don't, I don't think you have what it takes. You can't, you can't. You, you pretend to be the Son of God, you can't turn that stone into bread. And our natural response would be, you want to see me? Just watch me. You know, that would be a natural human response. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm kind of saying that when you're with God, those yeah. natural responses may not have the power that, yeah, exactly. that you have. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not... I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be something that, that fixes you. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that will pull you through mm -hmm. and the, that you can rely on. And that's just proving that you yeah. can rely on it. Well, and we're told, again by Ellen White, but the Bible supports this in a few places, Jesus often spent entire nights in prayer. And he what was he? That, he did that before this 40-day experience, and he did it all through his, his yes. ministry. Yes. So it wasn't something that, well, he, it was not done without preparation. No. All of his experience was, there was preparation before. Yep. And, yep. Uh, well, I'm going to ask you about the last sentence in this series of quotations okay. there. Uh, Angels of heaven were on the scene on that occasion and kept the standard uplifted that Satan should not exceed his bounds and overpower the human nature of Christ. So the angels were making sure that it was a level playing field? Yeah, more or less, yes. Do they do that for us? Yes. Seems to me if we took advantage if, of if, it. And, and we know this, absolutely. <clears throat> it, it, again, from the Bible and from Ellen White, look at the story of Job. God says, okay, you can do what you want to Job, but you cannot kill him. And that's what's happened here. I'm reminded of the text, something, uh, God will not allow temptations beyond what you're able First to bear. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I believe it is. Yeah. Well, the, there's also the possibility that, that Satan could have messed around with Jesus' system, his bodily system anyway, yeah. which would have made him, you know, Not capable of, of thinking, sir. Yeah, yeah, not thinking or anything like that. So there's all kinds of ways he could have made it appear like he felt he he fell yeah you know well, but so here, here's that what wouldn't we, have been a fair test yeah here's what we have the human jesus rises to divine heights during those first 40 days as he contemplated and he is he re-interacted with angels and the holy spirit and his father in preparation for the attacks of satan so how are we preparing myra's question in his temptations to Jesus, Satan appeared as an angel of light. He wanted Jesus to think he was just another one of those angels. He wanted to raise doubts in the mind of Jesus about his own, Jesus' own relationship with God. He suggested that maybe Jesus was the angel fallen from heaven. That angel had fallen from heaven. He says, you know about an angel from heaven fallen from heaven. I've heard about this angel who fell from heaven. I, you know, looking at you right now, you might be that guy. He suggested that maybe Jesus was the angel fallen from heaven. But Satan's first words immediately be, betrayed his identity. If you are the Son of God. And Jesus immediately, no, this is not one of those angels that's been here helping me out. But then how could it be a temptation that he could be a, the angel that fell from heaven? Because if he was a, the angel that fell from heaven, then he wouldn't have been the Son of God, would he? They both knew perfectly well that he was not the angel fell from heaven. But Satan was trying to trap him. He was trying to trick him. I mean, Jesus knew that. Satan knew that. Mm -hmm. Okay? After 40 days of fasting, Jesus appeared emaciated and near death. In his first conflict with Satan in heaven, he had conquered and banned Satan and his hosts from heaven. See, these two had been in battle before. And Satan and his angels were banned from heaven. Read about it in Desire of Ages 119. 
And in the Bible in Revelation 14? Yes. The appearance of Jesus at this point in time certainly did not suggest that he was the mighty Son of God from heaven who had accomplished that in the past. So look at Luke 4, 5 to 8. Satan and Jesus both knew that only God is to be worshipped. You remember that one. Um, I'm reading. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, uh, human beings cannot be, live on bread alone. Anyway, the devil took him up and showed him in a second, in a second all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all the power and all this wealth, the devil told him. It has all been handed over to me, and, if I, and I can give it to anyone I choose. All this will be yours then if you worship me. What do you think of that appeal? It's pretty bold. Pretty bold. Both Jesus and Satan knew that only God is supposed to be worshipped. So if Jesus knelt down and worshipped Satan, what is he saying? I recognize you as God. That's exactly what Satan has always wanted. Read about it in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. So Satan was presumably offering Christ a shortcut to accomplishing the task he came to do. Satan said, why go through all those difficulties that you've been preparing for and all that suffering when just by bowing down to me, that is to Satan, I will give you the world that you've come to redeem. In response to Satan's offer to give him the world, Jesus demanded that Satan leave him. Look at this quotation. Again, this is uh, from, uh, Desire, uh, from Review and Herald, September 1, 1874. It's also in five Volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, 1083. Jesus said to this wily flow, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt not worship the Lord, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan had asked Christ to give him evidence that he was the Son of God, and he had, in this instance, the proof he had asked. At the divine command of Jesus, he was compelled to obey. He was repulsed and silenced. He had no power to enable him to withstand the peremptory dismissal. He was compelled without another world to instantly desist and leave the world's Redeemer. And after, and after it was ended, Christ was exhausted and fainting. He fell upon the ground as though dying. Heavenly angels who had bowed before him in the royal courts and who had been with intense yet painful interest watching their loved commander and with amazement had witnessed the terrible contest he had endured for Satan now came and ministered unto him. They prepared him food and strengthened him, for he lay as one dead. Yes. Uh, verse uh, 6, um, he says, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Mm -hmm. Now where does, the, where does the text to support what Satan was saying there? There's none. He was just, blow, uh, just blowing smoke. Well, he, he did the same thing back in Job. I just what I was going to refer to there yeah. in Job. It, it, hey, where have you been? Well, I'm walking down on the earth. Well, I own the earth. I mean, yeah. it, is, it, it is figment of his imagination. Huh? Yeah. Well, he would claim that based, based on the fact that he tempted Adam and Eve, and he would have said, okay, the entire worldly population are on my side. They've left you, God. They're on my side now. That would be his claim. But, I mean, it says delivered to me by whom? You no, know, by no, actions no, no. of people. <laughs> what subtle temptations does God, Satan, does Satan bring to each of us? Subtle temptations? <laughs> I don't think these were very subtle. Are we tempted to compromise in our observance of the Sabbath, or perhaps in being completely honest at work in order to gain some advantage? And I mean, how many other common temptations do we think about? And how do we respond? Do we respond like Jesus did? In our temptations, like for say example, if we're fasting and we see an item that tempts us, it looks good during while we're during the fast, that feeling we have of wanting to break and consume something was the human Jesus's human side experiencing that Ab similar. Exactly. I one time, as part of a medical experiment when I was in medical school, fasted for three days. I can tell you, as a result of that, I lost 15 pounds. Wow. It wasn't all fat, I'm sure, but... Um, Actually, it was probably mostly muscle. Muscle and water, I'm sure. I lost a lot. I could not believe it. 
as a result of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, look at Luke 4, 9 to 13. Moving on with the Gospel of Luke. If I can find my cursor here. There it is. Then the, God, the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him on the highest point of the temple and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. Now, why would anyone want to do that? How, how does the devil be able to move Jesus around? He's given permission. Okay. For the scripture says God will order his angels to take good care of you. It also says they will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil finished tempting Jesus in every way, he left him for a while. Notice, for a while. And you know Matthew 4, verses 5 to 7, something. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, set him on the highest point of the temple, and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down from... For the scripture says, God will give any orders to his angels about you. They will hold you up with their hands, so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. And what's the problem with that quotation? It's not all there. It's not all there. What's missing? don't remember. <laughs> to keep you in your, all your ways. The intention of that verse is to keep us in the ways of God, not to keep us in the ways of Satan. Okay? But if we can hear Scripture in a time where we want something really bad, we, we, we intend to make it work for you anyway. So mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing that he was able to. Yeah. It's kind of something... Um, to think about his Jesus' answer to that temptation. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't really tell him anything. He just says, you can't te tempt me. He could have said that to all the, the other ones. But the difference here is this. We're all sinners. If we get tempted and we fall, it's just a, occurrence, a normal occurrence for us. He was God. Verse 12. Yeah. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Right, exactly. Is, is that Yahweh? Was he referring to himself? Any, any it, member was of the it, Godhead. Was he, it, was, it was referring to tell, <laughs> himself as <laughs> that well. That really kind of poking the Satan in his nose, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Note four major, yes. So what was the point of going to taking Jesus to the highest point of the temple? Because the Jews believed that that's how the Messiah would come. Explain. Well, they believed, they didn't know where, they knew about Micah. See, if you read, if you read John 7, it'll explain this, uh, just, just briefly in references. But they believed that, they, that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, just as predicted in Micah. But then they believed that he would disappear. Nobody knew where he went to. But then all of a sudden he would show up maybe on a white horse, I don't know, but he would come up and they believed he would appear on the, on the pinnacle of the temple and he would announce his, his Messiahship to all the people because the temple, of course, it would, it, would, it would maybe at Passover or sometime like that when everybody would be there, they would all know and then he would lead them forth uh, in whatever way was appropriate to conquer the Romans and, and lead them to victory. Was That's this, what... Was this showing up at the top of the temple? Was that based on Bible or was that no, no. based on legend? Legend. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so four major Bible teachings on temptation. One, no one is free from temptations. Two, when God allows temptations to come to us, which obviously allowed temptations to come to Jesus, he also provides grace to resist and strength to overcome. Three, temptations do not come the same way every time. And four, no one is tempted beyond his or her strength to bear. That's our 1 Corinthians 10, 13 we referred to a little bit earlier. Temptations are not sins. We need to understand that very clearly. Jesus was tempted just as we are. Did he ever sin? No. Temptations turn into sins when we make a conscious choice to yield. The temptations of Jesus while he was in direct conflict with the devil were a major battle in the great controversy over God's character and government. Is the great controversy a major theme in the Bible? Yes. Well, we think so in this group, that's for sure. Uh, where do you find information about the great controversy in the Bible? Well, I once did quite, spent quite a bit of time researching that and put together a paper 
that is more than welcome to any of you. If you would like to look it up, it's found at our website. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, Theox dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And go into the section called Teacher's Guides and under the section called General Topics, and you'll, one, you'll find a thing called The Great Controversy in Scripture. And you'll discover that right through Scripture, there's a lot of information about the Great Controversy, which a lot of people say is not in Scripture at all, but it is. Each of us is aware of at least some of our favorite temptations. Have we stopped to think of the best ways to use Scripture to answer, answer Satan's temptations? Will we be prepared for him the next time he comes with those same temptations? A good understanding of Scripture and a careful preparation are important in preventing our fall into sin. The baptism and the temptations of Jesus were followed by his return to the Jordan River where John was baptizing. There he acquired some disciples. And how did that happen? Remember, John said, Here is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. And some of his disciples, some, some of John's disciples said, whoa, we better, we better pay attention to this. Who is this? And they followed Jesus. And what did they say to Jesus? Do you remember? Where are you from? Where do you stay? Jesus said, come and see. And that was the beginning. He didn't officially call any disciples at that time, but that was the beginning of his work with them. He was announcing an all-out, full-strength war with the devil. As we noted last week, Luke wrote his gospel to the whole world. He wanted everyone to feel a relationship to Jesus Christ. But he also went to considerable length to point out that the birth, the life, and the ministry of Jesus were anything but ordinary. God's approbation of Jesus recorded in Luke 3.22 was the fulfillment of prophecies of, in Psalms 2, verse 7, and Isaiah 42, verse 1. This was the beginning of the journey that would end only with Jesus rising from the dead in his own divine power and coming forth from the grave to ascend to heaven. Fortunately for us, at the end of his life, Jesus was able to say, the ruler of this world is coming, has come to me and has found nothing in me. What can we learn from these experiences of John and Jesus that will help us to prepare for the daily battles that we fight with Satan and his angels. I would like to invite any of you who are listening to us from faraway places, other parts of the world, send, just drop us an, e an email. Let us know what you have heard and that you enjoy our message if you do so. We'll hear from you. Our <coughs> loving Father, we thank you for this wonderful lesson, for the privilege we've had to learn more about you. We thank you for the messages we have from Ellen White and the help that she gave us. Help us to minister to those who listen is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.